just to remind you what we we did last last time. Yeah, we established a fundamental theorem. Yeah, so the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane is a Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, this was, this was one thing. Then the, well, one of the last things we did, yeah, it was to to establish this relation, yeah, showing that we could retrieve, yeah, the well absolute distribution intensity of the source as if you would di dispose of a extremely large telescope, yeah, provided that we make the Fourier transform, yeah, of the distribution of energy in the focal plane. And that we divide it by the free transform of the same distribution, but for a point-like object. Yeah? And then we take the inverse Fourier transform. And today, what, what we will show at the end of the, of the lecture, that this quantity yeah, can be shown to be the autocorrelation yeah, of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane. Yeah? OK, but before doing that, I would like to come back yeah, to what, uh, well, we established last time for an extended object. We, we saw that the distribution of the surface brightness in the focal plane yeah, was the result of the convolution of well, the real source distribution that we don't know, yeah, convolved. So now I put a point because I, I think here in India yeah, it's a point. Yeah. Convolved yeah, with the point spread function, yeah, which is in fact the square yeah, of that value. Yeah. Now we 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 saw last time yeah, that if we consider here an interferometer yeah, composed of uh, two square aperture, yes. Now, well, I take. Uh, a value of small d for the side of the of the square. Well, yesterday I took a, but it doesn't matter. And then uh, the distance yeah, between the two center of the square apertures is big D. We've seen last time, yeah, or yesterday, that the expression yeah, of this quantity, so the module of a p key apq square is in fact equal to well it was two times d square uh, square times the sine square of pi pd divided by pi pd square times the sine of Pi QD over Pi QD square. So this is in fact the response fun function yeah, of a, just a square aperture. But then we had an additional term, yeah, which was the cos square of Pi PD, leading yeah, to the formation of the fringes. Yeah. Now we'll, I will particularize yeah, this uh, expression. Yeah, to the one dimension, one di dimension case, yeah. So I'm just interested of about what's going on along the p direction, yeah. Because along q, I have no interferometer, yeah. So only along p. So I could rewrite yeah, this uh, convolution product as follows: e p is equal to o p convolved with module module of a p square. You agree? Just one, one that dimensional. But for AP now, what I would take, so the module of AP square would be equal to, I would take the square root of that, so it would be 2D square, multiplied by this quantity will remain, sine, excuse me? This one? Yeah, what? It should be what? Who should be outside? Uh, no, no, I, I don't think so. It should be inside. 
Wait a moment, you will understand why. Well, the reason why I know it's a 2D square is the following, yeah? Uh, if I take P equals zero and Q equals zero, this is one, 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 yeah? So the, the intensity would be the square, yeah? Of the total surface of the interferometer, which is D square plus D square. Okay, but you will understand. Eh? So now, well, I'm just taking one of those. Now I take this one, P pi D square. This one I drop, I'm not interested in Q. And now I still have cos square pi PD. Okay. Now, if I insert yeah, this expression into that one, yeah, what will it be equal to, yeah? Well, of course, the 2D square will come here. Now, I assume, yeah, that, well, a single square aperture cannot resolve the, the source, because if I would resolve it, I would not need an interferometer, yeah? Which means that this quantity can also get out of the convolution product, yeah? So it will be times sine pi PD over pi PD square. And now comes the convolution of OP with the cos square of pi PD. Like that. Yeah? So th this is interesting for, I mean, well, any of you, yeah? To understand that if I'm not able yeah, to resolve the source OP with a single square aperture, yeah, and its contribution is given here, well, it behaves, the O to P behaves like a direct function, yeah? And so this is the reason why I can take it out of the convolution product. It's an easy way to demonstrate, yeah? But let's go on, yeah? Now this quantity, I will call it A, big A, so I say, okay, A of P square is equal to a constant A multiplied by OP convolved with cos square pi PD. Now I make use of the following relation, yeah? You remember that the cosine of 2 pi PD uh, or usually I, in my brain I remember it as, as, as the following cos square x yeah, is equal to uh, no cosine of 2x equal to cos square x minus 1 yeah so I make use of that property now, just here, and I find that this is also equal to the constant A multiplied by O P convolved with, uh, it will be 1 plus the cosine of 2 times PD, like that, divided by 2. You agree? Continue here. So I say this is equal to the constant A multiplied by. Now, if I convolve whole P with a constant, yeah, well, it's just the integration, yeah, of OPDP plus one half, so just write one half, multiply by uh, here I make an assumption, yeah, just to simplify the demonstration, yeah. I assume yeah that my object, yeah, is symmetrically sim well is symmetric with respect to the Y ordinate axis, okay? So it's symmetric. It makes things much more simple. In that case, I can say that 
or I may write it again, yeah, so it's OP convolved, yeah, with cosine of 2 pi PD, okay? Now, this quantity I will call it B, so can write this is equal A times B plus one half times Uh, did, did I lose something or not? No, no, I think it's okay. So the conversion product, yeah? Now I can say because OP yeah, is a symmetric with respect to Y, that it is a real quantity, and I may rewrite this as being the real part of the convolution of OP, with exponents, well, complex exponentiation here yeah, of i two pi pd. Okay, because if I take the real part of that, because this is the real, well, this will give me back the cosine. Now this is still equal to a multiplied by b plus one half times the real part of. And here I will execute yeah, the operation of convolution. Yeah? So I can say, well, it's the integration principle yeah, of O R times exponentiation of I two pi P minus R dr. Now I still have a big d here. d, dr. Do you agree? So this is explicitly yeah, the meaning of a convolution. Yeah? So here I have r, here I have minus r, and here I have p. Now I see, since I'm integrating, integrating yeah, with respect to the variable r, that there is a multiplicative factor of the complex exponentiation which may, may go out of the integral, yeah? And so this will be equal to a times b plus one half times the real part of, so it will be exponentiation of i two pi p d, like that, okay, multiplied by the integration of OR, exponentiation of minus i2 pi r d dr. Now here, do you recognize what it is? Fourier transform, yeah? So this is just a Fourier transform of the object. Okay? And now I have everything yeah, to calculate yeah, what is the visibility. So the visibility yeah, of the fringe, you remember it's a, it will be Emax. minus e min divided by e max plus e min. So it will be equal to what? Okay, now the real part yeah, of the exponentiation, yeah, well, this being real yeah, and uh, even, the Fourier transform yeah, is a real. It means that here, instead of uh, taking the real part of the exponentiation, I may take immediately the cosine the cosine, okay? And now, well, I may calculate what is the value of E max and of E min. So E max will be when the cosine is equal to plus one, E min when cosine is equal to minus one. So let's do it. So I, I find that it is equal to one times B plus one half. Well, the Fourier transform of O 
minus e min. So it will be minus a times b minus one half times the Fourier transform of O divided by e min plus e max. So it will be a times b plus one half the Fourier transform of O plus now a times b minus one half times the free transform of O equal. Now I see that here the AB and AB go away. And what remains? Yeah, it's a Fourier transform of O. The Fourier transform of O divided by, well, this and this yeah, will give me a null, null result. But then I will have twice the value of AB. So divided by two times the product of A times B. OK, now I should look what is uh, the value of A and what is the value of B. Now, do you, do you see what was the value of A? Uh, Here, yeah? This is here, yeah, right? Or not? Oh, yeah, but I forgot something, yeah? I forgot here the A, right? Yeah, correct. So the A and the A goes away. And 2 times B, so now the value of B, oh, this is B. So this, this was 1 half, so if I multiply by 2, I will just get the integrated. So it will be Fourier transform of O divided by the integration of OPE dP. And this I may rewrite it as being the Fourier transform yeah, of the object, but normalized. Yeah, normalized. Yeah. And so you, you see what we did today, yeah, we recovered yeah, a previous result, yeah, which was stating that for the case of two point like apertures, yeah, that the visibility, yeah, or was equal to the module yeah, of the complex degree of material coherence, and it was equal to the module of the Fourier transform of the distribution of the normalized intensity. Yeah? And that we established it yeah, for the case of a two point like apertures, rather than today, yeah, we established it yeah, for the case of two square apertures, but it could be uh, any, any kind of apertures. Yeah? What would be important yeah, to realize is that. This term, which represents yeah, the single aperture, yeah, may get out of the convolution product because we don't resolve the source with a single aperture. So it behaves like a delta direct function. Yeah? Now, what I wanted to show you yeah, <clears throat> is uh, how people use uh, interferometers yeah, to measure angular diameters. Yeah? And here is, a, well, just one example. I think it was the observations were made by Olivier Chenot, well, the French uh, interferometrist. And what you see here is represented, yeah, the, the spatial frequency, yeah, and the visibility, yeah, as an ordinate, yeah. And so you use a VLTI looking uh, at, uh, <coughs> you see, some irregular variable type uh, star. And he made uh, measurements of visibilities for different spacing yeah, of the two telescope, yeah? And you see that, in fact, yeah, already with one visibility measurement, yeah, it could deduce, yeah, probably very well, yeah, what is angular diameter. Now, if you take a second measurement, wow, this is confirmation. And as you take more measurement, yeah, well, you find that the, the agreement is excellent. Now, to see departure, yeah, from a model which is a uniform disk, you would need, yeah, to cover this part. And here you would see differences yeah, in the second lobe, but not in the first lobe. Yeah? <clears throat> now here, you would measure very faint visibilities. Yeah? And this is quite difficult yeah, to, to, to measure with precision. The uncertainty gets bigger. Yeah? So this is just one example yeah, 
of stellar visibility measurement. So the model which was adjusted, yeah, is uh, the following: the module, yeah, of twice the uh, first order Bessel function divided by its argument, yeah, and you see how good it is, yeah. And there are, of course, now hundreds of such examples in the literature, yeah. Well, sometime, yeah, when you you you, you could find that whoa, it doesn't work at all. Then you would say, okay, let's try now with a double star model, yeah, if it works, double uniform disk model with different intensities and unknown separations. And then, well, just with three, four measurements, you could find all the parameters of the binary system, yeah. Now, one thing I wanted to show you, yeah, is that, well, it's possible, yeah, to trigger interest of, uh, you know, young students to interferometry by making a um, the following uh, experiment, yeah? Well, already with your photographic camera, so such a photographic camera would be sufficient, yeah? You just need to design some mask, yeah? So you take um, <clears throat> a dark uh, piece of, well, a piece of cartoon, and then you just drill holes, yeah, with appropriate separation and diameter. And what, what you see here, it was during the training of, of students from my university. <coughs> We were putting on top of a, well, this was a big telescope, yeah? Well, a mass, yeah, with two little holes, so it was a bit crazy. We could have used, yeah, such a camera. It would have worked also very well. Here you see some of the mask, yeah? So it's just a piece of metal uh, drilled with, a, well, two nearby holes or well-separated holes. Or then to, to get more light, yeah? Well, we finally decided to drill slits, yeah? With the same thickness. You see another example of this was our collection yeah, during the training of students yeah, on interferometry. And here, what you see <clears throat> is uh, well, it's difficult to see because uh, th there is much light here. But you see here for a star uh, fringes, yeah, which are well resolved. Yeah, so it goes from uh, bright to, to zero intensity. So we don't resolve the star. Now the, our interferometer consisted yeah, of two holes, two millimeter in diameter, yeah, so very small, separated by 1.2 centimeter, yeah, so very small baseline. So therefore, we don't need a big telescope to do that. You can use such a photographic camera. You just put, you know, the mask in front of it and take the picture of the star. And now what I show you was well, the, the idea was res to resolve something. So we pointed the telescope to Saturn. And this is Saturn. And well, on my screen, I see it very well. You see fringe, you still, you still see fringes, yeah? But the contrast is not one. And it's not zero, it's intermediate, yeah? So the homework of the students was to use that image to measure the visibility. So the, you just adjust, a, well, a model, which is a every disk crossed by fringes which only parameter was the visibility, yeah? And so you, you could derive the angular diameter of Saturn, yeah? Well, with such a big, with, with such a small camera, yeah? Now I come back to VLTI, yeah? So <coughs> you see, it looks very nice. It's really worth to, to go once to Chile and uh, visit the, the site. Here is a better view, so I remind you, these are the four big telescopes, which are fixed. They cannot be transported, yeah? And here are the auxiliary telescopes, yeah, which are regularly moved, yeah, from uh, their location to better coverage uh, the UV plane. Well, in, at the distance, yeah, you see the VST, yeah? So it's a survey telescope. Now, well, here again, uh, we see the tunnels, yeah, through which the light, yeah, gets to the focus yeah, of the VLTI. And it is along yeah, these very long tunnels that you have the delay lines yeah, that I spoke last time about. Yeah. Now this is a view again, yeah, how many mirrors you have yeah, before uh, having the two beams interacting at the focus. Yeah. So I counted the number of reflections here, and there are 17. 17 reflection. So it's even worse yeah, than uh, as a diagram I showed a few days ago. Yeah, so you see the light comes here, it's reflected here, then here, goes here, then here, then here, then here, then here. Oops. 
Oops. And finally, long way. So the efficiency yeah, is quite poor because of the number, large number of reflections, but it's, it, it's a price to pay to, to do interferometry. Now, what I show you again, yeah, is the location of the four big UT, UT1, UT2, UT3, UT4. So the locations are fixed. Now, I will show you on the other diagram, yeah, the resulting uh, coverage of the UV plane if you are observing a star at the zenith. Okay, easy. So you see UT1, UT2, UT3, UT4. Now, from U UT1 to UT2, yeah, you have uh, one baseline. So you have one special frequency, which is represented here. But it's also true if you go from two to one, and therefore you see another arrow, yeah? So at the same time, you're covering yeah, these two frequencies, which are just opposite sign. Then you do the same, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four, three, four, yeah? And these are all the frequencies that you may get yeah, at the moment if you make use of the four telescope yeah, as an interferometer. Now the next uh, view shows you the UV coverage during a few hours. Yeah? If you observe a star with a declination of minus 15 or minus 65 degrees. And you see already here yeah, that you have a very nice uh, sampling or coverage of the UV plane. Yeah? But well, it's almost one night yeah, of observations. Yeah? And I guess with a VLA, yeah, you would do that in one minute. Yeah. Now the next transparency shows you, yeah, something interesting. Yeah. So it's just a simulation. Here is a source model. Yeah. Okay. So it's a source model, and then you assume that you use four telescopes of the VLTI. Yeah. During six hours, and the, this is the UV coverage during six hours of observation with the four UT. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's not bad, but it's not too good either. And now from the UV data that you get, you may retrieve, yeah? What you're seeing is the image. And this would be the solution, yeah? So this is using four telescope after six hours of observations, yeah? Now, let's assume that you make use of eight telescopes, yeah? During the same amount of time. This would be the UV coverage, yeah? Much better. And this would be the restoration yeah, of, the, of what you see is the real model from the data. And then now you see that the agreement is quite good, yeah, quite good. Here we have, well, many spurious detections. You don't know if it's real or not real, yeah. Yeah, so this was to answer yeah, one question that Hamid asked me, yeah. Well, well can you get an image, yeah, of uh, an object, yeah? So if... If you don't know what is a model representing your object, yeah, you have no other way than uh, sampling the UV plane as well as you can yeah, to retrieve what you think is the source model. A priori, now, if you have already a good idea of what the, the system is, yeah, for instance, a double star, then you just need a two, three UV space frequencies yeah, to find what are the parameters of the model. Now about closure phases, yeah. You raised a question, yeah, during a previous lecture, yeah. So the problem is the following, yeah. Until now we only made use of the visibilities, right? Not of the phase, yeah. And uh, you remember we we established previously that uh, the complex degree of mutual coherence, yeah, well, is in fact the visibility multiplied by it was something like that, minus uh, I two P U tau. Yeah. And this is where the phase yeah, comes in. Yeah, in the visibility expression. Yeah. Now the, the only way yeah, to recover some information about the visibility yeah, is to observe simultaneously with at least three telescopes. Yeah, three telescopes. So the three telescopes are represented here. One. Three. And uh, well, this could be radio telescopes, it would be the same, yeah. And uh, there is a here a problem, yeah, is that we don't know, yeah, between the telescope one and two, yeah, what is the effect of the atmosphere, yeah, above the mirror, yeah. There can be a well, layer of a thick hair 
and not over the other one, yeah? And you have to take that into account. So how do you do that? Well, we will know that the phase between telescope one and two, yeah, is in fact, yeah, the summation of the real phase due to the source, yeah, plus one phase due to this cloud, I would call it epsilon one, but minus, of course, yeah, the effect of the cloud above the second telescope, so minus epsilon two. You do the same, yeah, for the combination of telescope two with three and one with three. And now you see, if you co-add, yeah, these three phases, which are the observed phases, yeah, these quantities, yeah, would go away, epsilon one minus epsilon one, epsilon two minus epsilon two, epsilon three minus epsilon three. And what re would remain only, yeah, is information about the phase due to the source itself, yeah? Okay, that's good. So how people do that, yeah? Well, you take this expression, in fact, yeah? And you multiply the three visibilities between each other. So you get the product of the three module of the visibilities and the summation, yeah? of three phases which are associated with the source and not with the atmosphere, yeah? Of course, you, you don't get, yeah, uh, individually, yeah, the three visibilities. You get, yeah, the summation of the three. But this helps you to constrain your model, yeah? And uh, if you have a large number of telescopes, then it, it leads you to, to, to obtaining very good solutions. Okay, now, well, I will demonstrate the last theorem, which is the wiener kinchin theorem, yeah? And uh, you remember, well, I, I, showed, I showed it to you at the beginning of the lecture, yeah? That the Fourier transform, yeah? Of the response function, yeah? You could get it, yeah, from observations of a point-like star, yeah? But, well, if you don't have a reference star, what you do, well, it's possible, and if you don't have atmospheric effects, yeah, getting in, yeah, you, you could try to get it, yeah, from this theorem, okay? So you would find that the free transform of the response function of your instrument is equal to the autocorrelation, yeah, of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane, yeah? So now, just as an, an illustration, yeah, it's here. Let's assume that you have a, an interferometer composed of two circular apertures, no atmosphere, or you correct with adaptive optics, yeah, the, the effects of the atmosphere. And you wonder, yeah, what is the Fourier transform of the response function of that instrument? Well, since it is the autocorrelation of the distribution, yeah, of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane, you make the autocorrelation, yeah? So, we know that when you put this one on top of that one, well, you, you're sliding it, yeah? So before sliding in, we are here, yeah? Then when it enters here, we start being here. When it's completely over, we get it here, yeah? And after you get the, the two individual ones, of course, because um, uh, you have to, to look at all the situations. So, I have here one disk, and now zero is one like that, yeah? You see the color? Yeah? Yes? Yes, easy. And this is what we are going to demonstrate now. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, le let's go to the demonstration. You see, it's a, well, it's a very simple demonstration. Let's evaluate, yeah, what is the Fourier transform of IPQ? Yeah. So, well, it is a Fourier transform, of course, yeah, of the conjugate complex of APQ times APQ. Yeah. Now, it's equal now, I put a double integrate, integral yeah, of the Fourier transform. So this is uh, the exponentiation of minus i2 pi of p times x plus q 
times y uh, yes and I will have to integrate over x and y correct so here I can write times dx times dy now a star conjugate complex of a here I make use of the uh, fundamental theorem okay well fundamental theorem tells me that this is the conjugate complex of the Fourier transform of the distribution of complex amplitude in the pupil plane. Yeah? So it will be equal to double integral yeah, of a conjugate complex of xy multiplied by exponentiation yeah, of minus i 2 pi. Now it will be p. Now plus, because conjugate complex, Conjugate complex, yeah. P x plus q y exists. You know, on which variable do I integrate here? On x and y, right? So I'm just checking that. Wait. This is dp dq, sorry. And now here, pq, so I integrate over d x dy. OK, this I will just put at the end, yeah? dp dq. Now I must multiply by this quantity. Double integration, this is a free transform of a x y times exponentiation minus i two pi. So it will be p x prime plus q y prime. Now do you agree that this would be prime prime? So it will be dx prime dy prime, like that, and finally dp dq. Yes? Any question? No? Excuse me? So, apq, yeah, do you agree, is a Fourier transform of this quantity, yeah? So it's okay. Now this one is a conjugate complex. I multiply, it's okay. And this one for a transform is this one and I have dp dq. Yeah? Okay. So now <coughs> I'll come back to this. So I can write it down like this. It's equal to the exponentiation yeah, of well, let's put it like that. Well, I can write minus i2p multiplied by p times x. So I have already this contribution. Now I would like to get this one. So it would be minus x. And now this one. So this one is a minus, so minus x prime. Is it correct? Yeah, I think it's correct. Is it fine or not? Because well, I have my eyes too close to the blackboard, but I think it should be correct. Now, what I do, yeah? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I saw it again. Here I put a plus. Now I put a p. Now I multiply by x second plus, no, it's x second, right? Minus x prime, and here, this one, minus x, 
Correct. I close it. Now plus Q multiplied by So now I make use of this one. So it will be Y second. Now minus Y prime. This is correct. And now I have to take into account that one. Minus Y. Like that. Now I close my parenthesis. And now I have double integration of A star. So X second, Y second. And integrate double integration of A, X prime, Y prime, DX prime, DY prime. And at the end, DP, DQ. And DP, DQ, yeah, since here I have no P and Q, I can write it down here. So DP, DQ. Yes? OK. Now, do you recognize something here? Yeah. Well, it's a complex exponentiation, yeah, where I have the summation of two terms, yeah. So it will be the product of two complex exponentiation depending on independent variables, yeah. And well, if I consider the first one, yeah, if I integrate on p, so do you remember what this can be represented by? Yeah. So this can be represented by the delta function, yeah, of well x minus x second minus x prime, something like that, yes, and multiply by the delta function similarly, yeah, of y minus y minus x prime, something like that, correct? OK, well, I could rewrite it maybe in a different way. I could write as follows. It's also the product, yeah, of, because first I will execute, yeah, one of those integration, yeah. So I could write that it would be x second. I change the sign, yeah. Now minus x prime and minus x. Okay, so, so, or to write that it's minus this plus like that. Look, I change the sign, yeah? So I have x, this is minus, minus six. and here is minus x. Yeah, but I can do like that and put a plus, yeah? This is what I was doing. So it x again minus the summation of the two others. Yeah. And now here, the same delta of it will be y prime minus parenthesis y prime plus y. I close uh, one, two, three. And here one, two, three. Like this is correct, huh? Yeah. Okay. Now of course I have to insert this into that, and it will be finally equal to a double integration of a double star. Now x second will be equal to x prime plus x. Yeah, so it will be x prime plus x, comma y prime plus y, of course. Yeah, and now multiply by a time x prime, y prime, tx prime, dy prime, yeah? And this is the uh, autocorrelation, yeah, of the distribution of complex amplitude, yeah, in the pupil plane, yeah? So this is what we wanted to demonstrate, yeah? And well, this is very nice, because uh, whenever you have an interferometer, you would like to know, yeah, what is the power spectrum, yeah? This is a power spectrum, in fact, yeah? When we calculate this, yeah, this is a power spectrum, yeah? We find that it's simply the autocorrelation of the distribution of complex amplitude yeah, in the pupil plane. Yeah? So it's very, very useful. Yeah? 
it all provides you yeah, uh, high spatial frequencies. Yeah? These are high spatial frequencies. This also, yeah. Yep. So this is one, yeah? So you agree that APQ, yeah? APQ, yeah, is this one, yeah? Now, if I take the conjugate complex, yeah? Well, I conjugate complex here, and here I put a plus. I forgot to, 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 to put it, yeah? So this should be dx, dy. This was missing, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then, then I integrate over these variables, yeah? Making use of that, yeah? And so uh, this one, this one integration gives you that result, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, if I would have, yeah, square apertures, yeah? Two square apertures like that, yeah? Well, no doubt that the autocorrelation function would, would look something like that, yeah? You agree? And it's very nice to visualize immediately, yeah, uh, which are the high spatial frequencies that we obtain, yeah. Now, after T, yeah, what we will do, this will be an exercise as a preparation, yeah, for those whom, who, who should do a little work, yeah, in the context of these lectures, yeah. We will consider, yeah, an interferometer composed of N telescopes, N, yeah, where N can be uh, from zero, uh, from one to infinity. <laughs> Not zero, yeah. yeah. Okay, now, so we we came here to the end. Now, I, I just want to to indicate, yeah, that um, well, I have many more demonstrations going into details, yeah, and uh, well, they can be found yeah, via this link. Well, maybe some are in French, it's possible. <laughs> Sorry for that, but. I recommend you the reading of three three very nice books, yeah, for those interested in instrumentation, yeah. One is by Pierre Lena, yeah, and uh, collaborators. It's uh, observational astrophysics, yeah, and maybe you you have it in your library, yeah. Then the second one, yeah, is uh, not so old. It's by Andreas Glindemann. Well, Andreas Glindemann is an interferometrist uh, working at ESO, and uh, so uh, he knows about, about practical work. And uh, they just commissioned now the Matisse instrument at the VLTI, which is a very sensitive, uh, in, well, instrument yeah, in the infrared. Yeah? So it's a bands LMN. And then David Busher, who is uh, also a very practical astronomer and involved yeah, in uh, the Magdalena, Magdalena Rich interferometer. So this is in Socorro. Yeah? It's, uh, so these are, well, good reference books. Anyway, they are, in, they are already indicated in the lecture notes, yeah? So you will not miss them, yeah? What I will suggest is that we make use, yeah, of an interferometer composed of uh, n elements, yeah? So they don't need to be square, they can be circular or banana shape like yeah? And we will calculate, yeah, after what is a impulse response, yeah, of uh, such an interferometer, and then I will address yeah, the, the students who want to do some work yeah, uh, on that experiment yeah, to to calculate response function using uh, Python yeah, programming for different orientation of the star in the sky.